Hello viewers, Mark Gentili here, the managing editor of Sudbury.com. I almost said Northern Life, I got to get out of the habit of uh, reintroducing myself as the managing editor of Northern Life, that's going to take some getting used to. Uh, I'm up here in the top corner of your screen. Uh, joining me today for another live stream chat is uh, Sudbury MP Paul Lefebvre, who's safely ensconced in his compound, from what I understand. <laughs> is that right, Paul? You're safely ensconced? That's right. That, exactly. Been here for a while now. Yeah. Are you uh, totally working from home now and just uh, doing most of your business by phone? Is that how this is going? Um, exactly. All of it by email. But I try to reply and to answer everybody that I can by phone and have a conversation with them. Okay. So I'm not um, trying to respond to 20 to 30 phone calls a day. Yeah. And so we'll see. Uh, we'll, and we'll continue that as long as we have to. It's not a problem. Have you seen an uptick in the uh, the number of calls from constituents that you're getting uh, during this time? Uh, for, for sure, for sure. Listen, it's uh, my team and I have been usually is certainly for my team it's a nine to four job, and now it's a nine to nine job. It's uh, for them and for myself. It's always been busy. Uh, it's been to be expected, but now it's a volume of, of calls, people with great questions. Certainly, as this situation is very is changing on a daily to day basis, right? yeah. and as you know, our government has been really trying hard just to make sure that people get the benefits that they have a right to and that they deserve. The ultimate goal here is to make sure that people that have lost their job um, because of COVID nineteen, that as soon as the economy we're able to bring it back up, that they're able to start working as fast as possible and the right. businesses reopen as fast as possible. And that's a challenge. There's no doubt about that, and that's why we're trying to put all these measures that we are putting in, but it's not perfect. Certainly there's a lot of measures that are there that's going to help out people, but we're noticing also with all the conversations that I'm having that some may fall through cracks, right? And that's the last thing we want. So we're trying to adapt as we move forward to address those individuals and the businesses that may not may not fit into one of these programs. So anyway, so it, but and that's continued work. And that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying all the conversations that I'm having to learn and to hear from constituents to say, listen, th th this will help, great, thank you, or this will not help because. And right. so, and how can we design public policy? And it's, and it's in this day and age, we've never seen government have to act so fast, but we have to. And that's what we're focused on. And uh, it's not normal for public policy to take a week to Im implement. <laughs> uh, it usually takes months, sometimes even a year. But in these unprecedented times, it takes unprecedented measures. So that's what we're here for. Did the, the, did the SARS crisis um, help us uh, or better be a bit better prepared for something like this? Totally, totally for sure. Certainly before SARS, there was no communication between the federal government, certainly on the public health side and the provinces. And so because of, unfortunately, of SARS, we were now much better prepared to having our professionals, the health professionals, to advise government and to be able to much more nimble to determine and to have an action plan. And since the beginning, we've been in Canada, certainly been listening to our public health professionals from Sudbury, from Ontario, from the federal government to see how best to move forward uh, with this, with all the measures that we are putting in place. And so I think because of that, I think we're seeing, certainly there are, so we're still cases, it's not perfect, but I think we're seeing measures that we're in this and we're, and we're ramping up a lot of measures um, because of the professionals that we have advising us and how quickly that we can turn things around. Okay. So we, uh, we reached out to our readers for, uh, for questions. Uh, I know you're busy, so I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to keep you here all day. So I, I kind of like to get into this, uh, these questions, uh, from our, from our readers. Uh, we got quite a number of them. Um, a lot of them were sort of duplicates. So we kind of combined or, or, uh, or just took one, uh, the, of a, of a group that was a, of the same, uh, type, uh, to ask you. So if, uh, if you're comfortable, maybe we could get into these. Please, please do. Okay. So first up, uh, Dave, uh, David Zanin from Sudbury asks, um, why has our government not extended the hours of the 800 number for uh, um, employment insurance? It was bad before, but now it is simply impossible. I have been waiting for an answer from uh, Unemployment Board of Refu uh, Referees and the Unemployment Office since December 3rd, 2019. I'm supposed to be looking for a job. Instead, I spend hours and hours every day only to be hung up on by the 800 number. I believe I heard estimated average weekly calls were 4,500 before this, but last week there were all 900,000. Uh, 
Any wonder why we can't get through? The hours must be extended and a callback option offered. Now, I, I assume this is a bit of a moving target. Um, I, I'm sure that the employment insurance hasn't seen this level of influx of Canadians with millions of Canadians out of work. Um, what measures have been put in place and what measures can we expect uh, to help uh, the federal government, the EI offices, uh, manage this enormous influx of, uh, of need? Yeah, that, that, that is a very great question. That's one of the calls that we're getting people trying to get through and they can't get through. So what the government is doing is trying to do is uh, a, a few things. Before I, I get to that, again, as you said, and as, as the, the, uh, the individual, David, that with, with the question has already stated himself, we're up to 900,000 applications. Actually, we're, I've heard, we're hearing that it's up to 1.6 million applications. This has never, ever, ever been seen in the history of Canada. And therefore, trying to get a government operation to change overnight is next to impossible. That being said, the employees are working around the clock to address this. But given that volume, it's very, very, very challenging. That's why we actually put a lot of resources from other departments to come and help. Now, so when we talk about solutions, that's why um, last week we announced the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, uh, the CERB, the CERB. And the idea with that is that people that are being laid off, that uh, that they, uh, that are actually are had to stop their job to take care of the kids because they, they, there's no more school or there's no more daycare. So there's a plethora, there's a many, many di different cases. So we're, we've have tried to, to simplify it and have the web website through the CRA website through, so if you go to my account, you set up your, your account, the people that have lost their jobs and that can apply to get benefits. And there's a list of criteria, so we can go through that. But uh, basically that they can apply through that. And by April 6th, the, the portal will be open for applications, people putting in their requests for support. Now the support will be $500 a week for the next 16 weeks, unless they start to, to, to work again. And you need to have, if to qualify, you need to demonstrate that you uh, earn $5,000 within the last 12 months and that you're now out of a job and then that you're not earning any income. So those are the measures that we have put in place. But we, and because there was a different types of EOI benefits, sick benefits, and then we were, we were adding some more. We said, you know what, let's make it as simple as, as possible. So now with the one website, with the one, the, at the survey website, with my account, you'll be able to go in there and to apply for that benefit and we're trying to ramp it up so that you can get it as quickly as possible. So for the ones that have not, uh, that, that don't have direct deposit, I also encourage them to make sure that their information for direct deposit is there so that the check or the, 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 the funds or the benefits will be able to get into their account as fast as possible. I know that uh, my wife is an early childhood ed educator, and, and obviously she's, she's one of, of the people who's off work. She's one of the people who's applied for, uh, for employment insurance. Um, and we went through the, uh, the online application form. That is, is that the fastest and the best way for most people to get, uh, to get their applications in, is to use the online resource rather than trying to phone? Exactly. It, it is, and that's what we're trying to make sure, because, again, there's been a lot, there's been, there's been a lot of frustration. People trying to call and actually then that's why the service canada office in downtown Sudbury had actually stopped as well because people were coming in it wasn't safe people were frustrated and they were taking it out on some of the employees and that's not okay so that's why we had to basically shut it down for just for safety for everybody's safety given the uh how this uh virus is is contagious so but at the same time they they, they continue to work to help the for people but for your in in, in your case in, in your wife's case basically if she applied before for EI, they will be automatically transferred to this Canadian to the CERB. They don't need to reapply. They will be automatically transferred to this um, to this system. Again, our goal is to make it as simple as possible and easy as possible for people to access these much much needed benefits. So you only need to you only need to apply once, is what you're saying. That's right. You just need to get your name into the system and. Yeah. Hypothetically, the system will ensure that you get the benefits to which you're entitled. That's exactly. And if there's concerns, as we roll this out, I'm sure there'll be more questions and we'll see how perfect it is. Uh, but then that's why our offices are there to relay that back to the departments if there are challenges. But are, we're, you know, we're being told by uh, the great civil servants that we have in Canada that they're doing the best to make sure that this is as strong of a system that can be made. 
Okay. Uh, a related question, and I think you may have touched on it, but I think it's important maybe to reiterate. Uh, uh, Mary-Ève uh, Pepin, uh, she asks, uh, here's my question for MP Le Five. Uh, I'm ha I have been recently, no, sorry, I have been recently self-employed and working from home, so I think she meant unemployed, and working from home, small business. Now with the school closure and the kids at home, I can't operate my business anymore. I have to put my business on hold. As a self-employed person, I have not contributed to EI. What kind of help can I get? Uh, Ms. Pepin would like to know. Well, a bit of what I said before, and uh, same, same thing. So this Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, which is what you can apply for. So you should go to the CRA website, uh, my account, and by April 6th, the portal is supposed to be up and running. Uh, but if they haven't registered and open up their, basically, their information on my account, I encourage her to do so. And then from there, she'll be able to receive the the benefit of $500 a week uh, for the next 16 weeks. Or if she gets back to work before, then she won't uh, qualify anymore. Because if she, you need to demonstrate that you are not earning anything in that period as well. So, and, um, yeah. And, so, and, and, just, yeah. and just to be clear, by my account, you don't mean the Paul Le, Don't look for a link that says Paul Le Five. Look for the link that no. says my account. Exactly. So on the CRA website, you'll see my account. And then you tap, you tap that tab, and then you go from there, you register, and then when on April 6th, when it's up, and people can give them their information, and then that's the system that we're trying to make it a one-stop shop, simplify that people like Maria and your spouse, well, actually your spouse in the case, again, I want to repeat that, because we're getting a lot of calls saying, I, I applied for EI, it takes a while to get, now this funding is out there, it's more than my EI that I would get. How fair is that? And that's why we made sure that everybody gets the same thing in this crisis that, that we're all going through together. Um, a question that I, I, I uh, that may, is sort of related to this, people who are on um, uh, ODSP or anything like that, do they also qualify for the CR, for the for the CERB, or how does that work, do you know? No, you need to have, have earned income in the last uh, in, in the last year, Okay. right? And over $5,000, if right. they didn't work and they didn't earn over $5,000, they don't um, they, they don't qualify for, for the CERB. And, and it's a good question because we're getting a lot of people that are asking that are on a fixed income, like ODSP or CPP or different pension incomes, saying, well, what, what's in it for me? Why can't I get these benefits? What we're trying to address in a very, very quick fashion is basically individuals that have lost their job, that was earning an income, and all of a sudden the revenue side of their world has dropped off precipitously, almost, a, right? But their expense side is still the same thing. But if you're on a fixed income like ODSP or CPP, you're still getting your income and your expenses should not have risen at all right? in, 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 a, in, in the world that, that we're in right now. So that's why it's a great question because it's important that people realize that, that if you're on a fixed income, I've been hearing from people that are self-employed that uh, saying that it'd be nice to be on fixed income right now. <laughs> We actually have a, do have a question from uh, Claire uh, Vincent Vio, who has a question actually about CPP. She she says uh, the federal government announced they will be assisting seniors by providing funds to agencies such as Meals on Wheels to assist. Uh, would it not be easier for the government to give the funds to seniors directly by increasing the old age security an additional three hundred dollars a month for each recipient during the crisis? This is what uh, what they are going to be doing for the child tax credit for children. Uh, at least this way, we can be sure that seniors receive the uh, receive the money rather than third party agencies. Was this a concern when, uh, or maybe just can you talk about that a bit, Paul? Well, certainly, and uh, seniors, I've, I've I've been hearing a lot from from seniors concerned about this, and, and it's a great question. It's a very relevant question. And so what we've been trying to do is really initially, uh, one of the first things that we did was saying, listen, individuals that qualify will get actually their GST, actually yeah, double up. So a couple is actually gonna get $600 more of the GST rebate that they get. If you're an individual, it's 400. So we're, we, that, that is one measure that, that we put in place. For some people saying, well, that's not enough. We wanna see more. And so the question with, with respect to old age security, um, helping out seniors, it's, it, it's a really relevant one. Certainly that, that's something that we are discussing at the federal level. Uh, one other measure that we put in place is with respect to your RIFs. So if you're over the age of 72, we've got to start taking out money of your RRSPs that you put that, that, that you put in. Now we've actually reduced that by 25%. One of the conversations that I've been having with the ministers of the federal government saying, can we stop that? Do we, in, in this age, 
if, if they don't need to access the funds, because we know a lot of these investments have dropped down to 30, 40% lower than, than, than they were a month ago, right? So they don't want to be taking out money out of their RRSPs or, or now that is turned into a rift. So are there measures, more measures that we could put in place there to, to, to secure their, their, their funds? So those are also measures that were put in place. But I'll go back to my comments earlier. You know what, right now, given the emergency situation that people two weeks ago, three weeks ago lost their jobs and their income has dropped to zero or next to zero, right now our focus is to make sure that they have food on the table and that they're able to get shelter, pay, 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 pay for shelter, and as well as ensure that they can still communicate. So having a phone and be able to be able to hear what's going on in the rest of the world, in the rest of Canada, in the Ontario subway, because if they don't have information, then they can make great decisions based on, on very important uh, in, in information. So we'll, those are the three pillars uh, which we're looking at. At the same time, as, as this moves forward, uh, it's changing day by day. So I, what I would tell Madame Vio, um, Claire, is that uh, certainly her concerns have been heard loud and clear, and we're looking at how we, we can address that. And as, uh, as we move forward, we're looking at different public policy um, proposals that, that we can put forward to help everybody out. Okay. Uh, I have a question from a, from another business owner, not a home business owner, but someone who, who owns a, a salon, a, a fella named uh, Pat Fiella or Faella. Uh, Pat says, uh, as an owner of a hair salon whose staff work on commission and uh, has been closed since March 20th, can you please provide an explanation of how EI, the $2,000 a month emergency benefit and the 75% wage compensation will merge or be separated or be streamlined? Do my staff apply for only one of these benefits? or a combination of two or more? I know you explained it, but I, I, I'm sensing from the question that there is, because there are so many uh, balls in the air that people you know, may be a bit unclear about what they're supposed to do. And it's a great question. I want to say hi to Pat, because I, I, I know Pat, so I want to thank him for, for the question. Does Pat do so your maybe, hair, Paul? Uh, no, he's not, unfortunately. Uh, maybe he should be. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I will tell. But um, with respect to his question, it's a great one, but on the EI and the CERB, CERB, I think I've, I've been clear on that. Right now, the system that we put in place is the CERB. Everybody's gonna get $500. But for his situation, so he's a small business owner, he has employees. Now nobody's working because they're not allowed to work. Um, so basically, what can he do? And now we've announced on Friday a wage subsidy of over 75% uh, of your wage subsidy, so you, for, of your employees that you have. So he should be looking at whether it makes sense, maybe with his accountant, or maybe he can figure it out on his own, to so whether it makes sense to for his employees to go through the CERB or just go through the wage uh, of subsidy. So there's a bit of a calculation to be made. I'm not sure how much they're getting paid now, right? It's, it's all based on, on, on their situation, but there are different options out there for him. Um, what I'm hearing from different, different owners, it, it, or uh, SME owners, it, it depends. And so it's up to them to really uh, to, to sit down and look what I, what's good is that there's more than one option, right? There's more than one option for the employees, and, and it's not as if you're, it'll be the lowest of the both. It's the best of both, of, of one or the other, that, that they can apply for. Okay. So that's what I, I encourage them to do, and certainly something that, uh, again, the idea being that once the economy gets back up, the staff will be about back up and, and working as quickly, quickly, quickly as possible. So for people like Mr. Fiella, uh, best advice for them would be to visit the Canada Revenue Agency website and find the resources there? Is that... Uh... Yeah, that, that is one. And again, I, I also encourage them to talk to their accountant or to okay. their banker as well. Okay. Those are the frontline people that are aware of all these programs and the, and the intricacies. And they're all and this the, the best case scenario for him and his staff is based on the facts that I don't have all the facts in front of me, but, it's, but uh, there's options for them. Okay. Um, Dan Taylor uh, asks, I'm a student who is graduating from Cambrian College at the end of April. I currently do not have a job affected by COVID-19, but might have a hard time finding one. Is there any assistance available to me out of what the gov federal government is rolling out? So for post-secondary students, students, things like that. Yeah, actually I had a con a, many conversations with uh, students like uh, Dan that are just graduating and then they're looking at the outside world and saying, "Listen, what's in it for me? What's going on out there?" And it's uh, it's not as it's it's, it's a difficult situation. Um, if Dan worked in the last twelve months and uh, he made over five thousand uh, dollars, I believe from what I'm I'm reading myself, what I've been told is that he can apply for the CERB. Um, so that is an option for him that he should at least apply and see what happens. Um, and then after that, certainly students 
and the job market is something that we're looking at. I know that uh, in Canada summer jobs uh, that the Canada federal government always rolls out. In uh, the past two years, I've had you know to have job fairs for students to come in, and given the circumstances, we're not going to be able to do that. However, we are looking at how can we amend the Canada summer jobs to address the certain of the job shortages that are out there in the in the immediate need and in the midterm and in the medium need as well. So we're, it's it's very difficult situations for everybody, as well as the federal government trying to ensure that some people like Dan get a job as fast as possible. And so right now, again, you can apply for that, and uh, but and we're looking at other options to see how we can help. There's also some relief, I think, the prime minister announced today for uh, student loans. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. That was, thank thank you for, for for raising that. Yes, the uh, the, the prime minister last week, I believe raised that uh, certainly if you have student, Canada student, uh, student loans, you don't need to repay them for the next six months. So at least there's relief there. Um, but yeah, so those are, there's a, so, some small reliefs here and there. Uh, but again, it's uh, not as good as getting a job as you, as you graduate, as we all hope that we will. And you were there and I was there uh, not too long ago, I would like to think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep, keep thinking that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, so this is a bit more of a this is a, a bit of a different question. Um, uh, Guy Rochette uh, asks uh, the order in council. It's very specific. The order in council passed on March 26th prohibits foreign nationals from entering the country if they exhibit signs and symptoms of COVID-19. But the legislation appears to exempt people from the U.S. who intend to make a refugee claim. Mr. Rochette finds this alarming and frightening, he says. Now, what I want to know, what he wants to know is, is this the case? Is he reading this order in council correctly? Uh, are uh, Ameri American or U.S. citizens who are making refugee claims, are uh, they exempt from these uh, provisions banning foreign nationals who exhibit signs and symptoms of COVID-19? And if is, that is the case, what is the rationale for such an exemption? So even before we get there, the answer is no. Okay. That is not uh, the, the case at all, actually. It's an unprecedented move on, our, on the part of our government in, the, in history of Canada to actually close the border to any asylum seekers uh, that, that want to cross. We actually have completely stopped it, given the emergency situation that we have and the lack of in, in, ensuring that our resources that we have are going to help Canadians right now. And so it's been a difficult to, uh, decision, but I think it's the right one for, 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 for the time being. So. I'm, I'm not sure where he found that information or the way that uh, his analysis, but uh, in my, what I'm hearing and what I know, that, that is not the case at all. Everybody that is trying to get to Canada um, is being turned back at the border. Okay. And now I know um, the Prime Minister uh, has spoken about, uh, you know, there was a suggestion by President uh, Donald Trump that uh, they should be troops stationed along, along the border, which a lot of Canadians found uh, funny and uh, as if Canadians would be trying to enter the U.S. at this time. Uh, the Prime Minister also said, you know, this is the largest undefended border in the world and we intend to keep it that way. But what, I, what I'm curious about is, there, has there been any discussion about, um, because the situation in, in the United States is quite a bit different from the situation in Canada in terms of the number of cases, the spread of COVID-19. It's, it's quite a bit more serious at this stage down in the United States than it is in Canada, at least at the moment. Has there been some discussion about, about the uh, potential for, for refugees from the United States attempting to flee north to Canada? Well, certainly right now at any port, regular port of entry, uh, they're not allowed in. Yeah. Right, same as Canadians are not allowed into the U.S. That is the agreement that we were able to secure with the U.S. And I don't, I recall at the time people were a bit impatient as to why it took so long, but it was to make sure that we have goods that slip across the border. Certainly, we need food, we need medicine. So before we unilaterally closed our border, we needed to do it with our partners, the U.S. So I think in that sense, and that can give you a background of where we were two weeks or two and a half weeks ago now. Um, but with respect to uh, Americans trying to get in, our borders, like again, anybody trying to seek asylum or a refugee state are not being allowed in. We've actually suspended that agreement we have with the U.S. So that is an agreement that uh, we're going to stick by until the situation resolves. Okay. Um, this is a question we got from, from several different people, is, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Charlie Hebert, uh, who uh, wants to know why we're still paying the carbon tax during the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, well, I'm not sure if that's a tax question or a, an environment question, but um, actually, I think given the situation that we're in right now, actually more Canadians are getting more money. This is another support for Canadians. Actually, nine, it used to be eight out of ten, 
but given the situation, I, I more than assume that's well, well, nine point something percent, uh, nine out of ten Canadians are actually receiving more money out of the car, uh, the covered in fee and dividend than before. And so I think it's, this is another measure to help Canadians out. And so, and given the price of gas uh, that we've never seen, well, I got to go back a long time ago, so I, I recall those prices um, that we've uh, we've seen. I don't think it's, it's affecting any businesses at all right now. And so at the end of the day, these are measures that we put in place that are keeping going, and, but uh, nobody that I'm aware of is being affected by this. And actually, like I said, it's actually a positive. People are actually, it's another measure to help Canadians out. Okay. Um, one last question. Uh, well, one last question from our readers for you, Paul, and then I have uh, something else. One more thing I wanted to ask you. Um, now, we got this question a lot. We heard this from a lot of readers, and uh, or a lot, and I wanted to give you a, a sort of a chance to respond to it, because there seemed to be quite a bit of... of um, uh, uh, the questions that came in were, were a little bit angry about this fact. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm hoping you, you can respond to it. But Mary Bedkowski was one of the people who wrote in. And uh, what Mary wrote is, uh, in a time of crisis when people are losing jobs and their lives have been turned upside down, I don't understand why you, MP Paula Five, and your colleagues, colleagues would accept a pay increase. Uh, everyone in this country is feeling the economic crunch, losing businesses, fearing they won't be able to feed their families, and uh, Canadian MPs uh, received a pay raise. Um, can, can you explain this? Uh, can, can you explain why how this happened or why this happened or if this happened? This is a you know, listen. It's a really relevant question and it's a fair question. Since 2005, the public servants in which the members of parliament are included get an, an increase of I think it's two four five or two percent every year. So that's an automatic. So when I saw that myself, I would say I'm not too very proud of that given the the, the, the situation that we're all in as Canadians. So what I actually did uh, two days ago, I actually called the financial uh, services, so the, uh, the the support for MPs from the House of Commons saying, can I, uh, obviously, can I opt out of this? And they said, no, it's like if you're part of a collective agreement, everybody gets it. I said, okay, well then what I'm going to be proposing to do, well, I'm, I'm going to be doing is actually donating that increase that I'm, I'll be receiving. I'll be starting off first with the food bank. Because again, in these difficult times, I, it's, it's tough and it's, it's not something that we can actually suspend because we're not in the House of Commons right now. We can't go back to the House of Commons and, and suspend these things, the, these increases. And it would not only be to us, it would be to all public servants at the same time, because the law is, is, is a general law to law, everybody. There's a lot of public servants out there, however, that are working overtime and on weekends, and to an extent they've never had to work before, given the situation, they're there to help Canadian citizens. So for them, I think that this is that this is okay but again for me i in my situation like i said i i again that's why i feel that it's a fair question and that for me i'll be taking my own approach or my, my, my own measures to do to to help out and i think the best way that i can do is actually doing it back that increase to the community and to different organizations uh, do you know how much the like in a dollar amount like how much the rate the increase is about well, again, public uh, certainly public servant salaries are, are, are public knowledge, and as well as MPs as well. So you're looking at around if it's a 2.53 percent raise, you're looking at around a fifteen hundred dollar, two thousand dollar, twenty five, and all the taxes that are taken out um, over twelve months. Okay. Right? So, so, that's, so, so, that's, so that's the increase that you're looking at, and so that's why, um, again, for me, I'll be doing that part for the next twelve months. So a couple thousand dollars, kind of, is about the amount. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So um, we didn't, I didn't put it, you know, we don't have it on the question list here, but we've been hearing it a lot, and, and I'm sure you've been getting a lot of questions about this is, you know, um, with, you know, provincial governments, federal government um, spending so much money to try and get Canada through this COVID-19 pandemic crisis in one piece, um, deficits are ballooning. Um, is there, what kind of plans are in place for what happens after. How are we going to pay for all of this? Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly, and I'll, there's two approaches, to, or there's, there's two uh, aspects to, to your question. Certainly, right now, we're, all, we're, we're focused on making sure that people can make ends meet today, right? We are in an emergency situation. We need to be looking at this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. However, as you said, what is our plan to get out of it, right? As we look forward, and that's why a bit of our plan is to make sure that people are still employed that's what we're trying to work hard and that when we're, it's back up and running they're able to get in their jobs back and get the economy back and and, and running 
And so there's different measures that I'll be looking at that to certainly to to speed up the economy at, at that point in time. So there's a lot of measures that are being put in place. But what I can tell people is that these uh, these deficits that are obviously that are being projected, they're temporary in the sense that these are not structural deficits that will always be there, right? We're being, being positive here that we're going to get out of this in an earlier, right, than, than the next year, certainly in the next few months that I'm hoping. Who knows? Nobody knows, but it certainly, um, but we need to be looking at that in the short term. And then certainly as we turn a corner, you know what, these deficits are going to be dropped down to where we were before. And so I think you're, in, and so I think as Canadians, we can rest assured uh, that uh, these are temporary measures for very, very dire times that we have never faced in the history of our country. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add, Paul, or anything you would you think that uh, constituents uh, of yours need to know uh, at this time, or no, anything you'd like them to know? Like a lot of people are trying to guess when will this end. Nobody knows, right? The only thing that we do know is that we all have a role to play. That role means staying at home, right? Washing your hands, and if you do need to get out, certainly protect yourself as much as you can, and certainly reduce any social, uh, you know, interaction. Certainly any physical interaction. But at the same time, I'm concerned for a lot of people that for their mental health. So um, I would suggest people, if you have friends, reach out to them, see how they're doing. Certainly elderly people that may be living alone or friends that, that are alone as well. Just reach out to them saying that because we're all, as we're saying, we're all in this together. And there's so many great stories out there. There's certainly people from Sudbury stepping up to the plate, wanting to participate and help out in producing masks, gowns and gloves, right? There's just so many great stories out there. And we got to be focusing on the positive. I know it's tough in, 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 in these circumstances, but we will get through this. We will get through this together. And our focus is to make sure that you know what, we will be able to get people back working and having the lifestyle that they're used to as fast as we can. Great, excellent. MP, uh, Sudbury MP Paul Lefebvre, I want to thank you for uh, joining me on Sudbury.com uh, today. And to our readers, uh, for all your uh, COVID-19 news and uh, for anything else you need to know about uh, the city of Greater Sudbury and what's going on in the area, Head to Sudbury.com. There's something new uh, every hour of, uh, of every day, practically, on the website. And uh, we will be back here tomorrow uh, with uh, MP Mark Suray from Nickel Belt, where we will be uh, catching up uh, on the situation in Nickel Belt. So for today, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Lafay, for joining us. Thank and you. thank you, uh, readers, for, uh, for joining us as well. Have a good day. Wash your hands.